So we're just on our way to go to John Cullen. We're on the King's Road. We're running late as always, and we're going there for a design day. They're gonna be sharing some lighting design tips and ideas with us. We often work with them as the lighting designer on our projects. We've got an amazing showroom, and also I wanna make sure that I get some good lighting tips for you guys, so come along. How are you? Ollie, this is Sally, who is like the lighting design expert. Um, she runs John Cullen and she's the best lighting designer in the world. So. You're too kind. I don't think so at all, but I love my job. <laughs> well, you're very good at it. Are the team all here? Yes, they okay, are. great. Let's go up. And here's an example of the scene setting. So here, a bright scene, and then I'll just work my way through the scenes so it becomes darker. And you can see some lights are dimming down, some other lights are going off, and that changes the mood and how it feels. I love the team at John Cullen. They're amazing at what they do, but they're also lovely people. Um, so it was just really fascinating to sit there and take in all their design inspiration, all their design knowledge. My very first project with them was an amazing project we did. It's called the Mayfair Project on our website. It was a grade two listed property. And I remember thinking, we need lighting expertise here beyond what we have within our team. You know, we do design, lighting and team. But I think if it's something that you do day in, day out, all over the world, and they have a huge design team, they're 60 staff now, there's no way any design studio, any interior design studio can compete with that. And I want to give my clients the very best of every area of design. And so if they have the ability and the budget to work with a lighting designer, as well as having an in-house interior designer, why would you not want to do that? I mean, it, I think what the case studies that they showed us demonstrate is that lighting can make or break a design scheme. You know, it can make or break a piece of art it brings everything to life. So it was really nice to, for me, I've seen that before, but really nice to share that with you guys, share that with my team, great inspiration. And seeing how you can manipulate a space and make the ceiling feel lower or higher using the light, you know, you'll completely understand the power of what lighting can do. So I'll just talk to you about some of the practicalities behind lighting. Do you recognize this? <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> we've modelled up uh, Sophie's living space here. It was really weird for me when they showed the, um, the mock-up of my kitchen, and obviously I redesigned my lighting with John Cullen um, three and a half years ago now, and it was quite an unusual project for them in the fact that we were retrofitting, so I didn't want to rip up my floors, I didn't want to take the wallpaper off the walls, I very much limited them what was possible. Like, we basically just opened up the ceiling, um, we changed the lighting system, uh, changed the positions, the lights, the fittings, all John Cullens, and it made a huge difference. But there were some things where I sort of pulled back and I was like, in my kitchen, I'm not going to rip up the floor. <laughs> Those lights did look good there. But then it, they showed me the difference the lights made, and now I'm like, oh God, now I've got to go home and rip up my floor. So it was actually a very expensive meeting because there's going to be a lot of demolition um, in my home as a result. But. No, I just love what they do. I trust them implicitly. You know, when we were working with my house, it's very unusual for me to sort of lean on someone else for design expertise. But when they tell me to do something, and, you know, even if it's going to cost an extra or whatever, I think, you know what, they're telling me for a reason. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. If I just switch to the next scene, you'll see how we go from using one layer of lighting, which is your down lights, to using multiple layers of light. And then that's what gives you that textured lighting effect. So you can see instantly this wall starts to come to life. Probably didn't even notice that before, <clears throat> but with the light set close to it, skimming down, you can accentuate the texture and you get that contrast between light and shadow, which is really powerful. The artwork, I mentioned when you enter the room, your eyes are drawn to the brightest thing and now it's this artwork the sculpture and that's exactly what you want to see so we we manipulating your experience by directing your eyes and we've got just a spotlight at the top there which is coming down and catching on um, all the 3d elements creating that shadow effect we can do this instead up lighting and this is using a fitting called contour edge 
um, which is a, a linear exterior rated product, but we use it quite a lot inside as well. A great interview with um, uh, Sally, Sally story. As well. Yeah, talk to me about that. Yes. And when did you first meet her and, and any backstory with that? So or? Sally's an amazing person. Like when you see her on screen or when you meet her in person, she's so unassuming and so humble. You always wouldn't believe that she heads up that company, that she is such an expert, you know. I've met people over the past few years who've had Sally commission the lighting or had Sally personally design the lighting in their home. And it's like watching an artist at work. Apparently what she does, you know, I've not seen her in person do it, but when she talks about lighting, she's so passionate about it. And there's nothing about lighting she doesn't know. She's written books on it. Um, but I first met her Probably, I'd say, maybe three, four years ago. We did a um, design talk together with um, Andrew Hills, who owns Porta Romana, for Chelsea Harbour Design Centre. And, you know, she's one of those people I just instantly like. I think she's so open and authentic, but at the same time, a real design powerhouse. I think she's amazing. A lot of our followers have got questions about lighting, so I'm going to give you some quick fire questions and if you could let us know what advice you would give. So the first question we've got is, what is the best way to light a staircase at night, under stair, beside stairs, or lighted railing? I'd say it would depend on the staircase, because some staircases will work well with floor washers. Some could look very contemporary and could be off the wall, in which case you could have a linear beside it grazing up the wall and giving a soft reflected light or sometimes I've even done a handrail, so each stair is like a piece of sculpture and should be considered individually. What temperature, 2700 or 3000 K for a more luxurious and cosy feel? Definitely not 3000 K. 27 is great for your feature lighting, but I will often even use 24 for linear in shelving, just to get that warmer look that is so much more inviting at night. And do you ever do different temperatures within the same house depending on what room type it is or do you like to keep it consistent? I think you can change the colour temperature. For example, you can have 2.7 for your down lights and 2.4 for your strip and your table lamps. And that I would always do as a considered thing. I would never use two different colour strips in the same room. But you could decide your utility or basement area, which is always to be bright you might want a cooler colour temperature for the LED strip lighting. Best lighting for dining tables. Have you got any advice on lighting your dining table? Best lighting is to look flattering at night. I think candles are amazing, but sometimes you want something to supplement the candles and the flicker of the light. And then I think a chandelier can add presence but must be dimmed. But some very tight, narrow beams onto your flower displays can really draw in the drama of the dining room. What kind of lighting should there be in an office slash study? In an office slash study, I think you need to get look at two sorts of lighting, an ambient lighting and a task lighting. Mm -hmm. Probably the simplest for task lighting, we can do it from the ceiling with two spots, but it could be just a table lamp or desk angle poise. For the ambient lighting, sometimes a soft reflected light off the walls or bounced off the ceiling with an uplight above cupboards can give a soft ambient light and you might combine that with a decorative pendant in the centre depending on the size of the room. What colour spotlights do you recommend? This person saying that they're thinking of white gloss, do you like to match them with the surrounding material? I think that totally depends on the look. If you want them to disappear then white gloss would be good but there's been a whole trend recently for a slightly more technical look where you might have critical glazing and a white space and then a black track might look more contrasting and pick up a more contemporary look. And um, best lighting for long dark hallways that has no windows? Layering of light on a hallway is essential. So you could have a combination of decorative lights looking as if they're providing the light. Could be with pendants, could be with wall lights. Combined with feature lighting to break up the space. And I love up lighting. I often think creating portals along a long corridor actually gives you like an entrance to each space and really helps and uplighting those breaks up and makes it seem like individual rooms. Are there any books, tutorials or courses you can recommend? <laughs> we naturally at John Cullen Lighting do a masterclass and my lockdown book 
was Inspire With Light. Really, it's a guide to telling you all the tricks I've learned over the years and really tell you some of the technical things you need to know about LEDs, what colour temperature, how to choose them, how colour rendition is important. But more than anything else, it tells you how to layer the light and different solutions for different rooms. And if people want to come to one of your masterclasses, where can they find out where the masterclasses are on? If they look on our website, all the masterclasses are listed and then they can book them. Anyone's welcome. Thank you so much, Sally. Thank you. So we ran out of time with Sally, obviously she's such a busy lady um, and she answered as many of your lighting design questions as she could. But now we have the next best thing. <laughs> no, special guest. Not that he was my second choice, but this is Anthony. For some of you channel regulars, you might recognise him. Anthony is one of my lead designers. He's my right hand man and he is our resident in-house expert on lighting. So I thought I would go to you with some of the audience's questions and see what you have to share. I'll see how I can help. Thank you for joining <laughs> us, by the way. I've dragged Anthony out of the design studio um, away from answering some inquiries to do this, so we appreciate your time. Thank you. Give him some love in the comments section. <laughs> <laughs> for a rectangular dining table, Anthony, that is 2.3 metres long, would you do a single wide pendant or multi-pendants? I would probably be inclined to do a single pendant, um, not too wide, I wouldn't go too wide, you still want it, um, you want the, your pendant to be, uh, I would say 15 centimetres in from the width of your dining table, so that it doesn't end up being too overpowering when you're sat on the length of the table. Um, yeah, Good point. Yeah. You know the project we did in London, that new build family home, what was the length of that dining table? Because we did two pendants there. Yes, that was, um, that was, it was actually three metres. That was dining it? Table. Yeah, it was quite Interesting. long. Interesting. Yeah, 2.3 is just too, a little bit too short for th two pendants, I'd say then, because that yeah. was a nice, comfortable mm -hmm. size. We'll share a picture with you guys on the screen so you can see the project we're talking about. But you wouldn't want to go smaller than those two pendants, would you? Because then they would feel a little bit insignificant in the room. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not only that, but um, I mean, I don't know what Sally, the lighting guru, covered today. But, um, you know, one thing that you want to factor in is over your dining table, you know, whilst, whilst it's lovely to have a decorative pendant, um, they don't always give you the, the best lighting. They kind of throw light everywhere, whereas you may want to choose to have some um, spotlights angled towards the, the length of your table just to light the surface of that as well. What would you do in a shower? LED strips or mini down lights? And this person has a niche, but what would you do if they in a niche and what would you do if they didn't have a niche? Um, so, even if they had a niche, I would still be inclined to do a discrete LED strip in a channel just above the shower wall. Um, and you can get those in quite a, a narrow channel. I think what, it's normally 10 centimeters, I think we do a channel, which is just above the shower, and then you put your LED strip tight in the corner so you'll never see the light source. Yeah, we've got um, a good example we could share of that um, yes, boys' we do. bathroom, so we we'll do. share with, that with you guys on the um, screen. And you know, as I'm reading this question, I think they're talking about one of those niches where you put your shampoo bottles. Oh, what okay. do you prefer? I prefer a spotlight in those, but do you like an LED strip or a spotlight? I think in those, oh, I, I'm more LED strip. Are you? You can, get, you can get the LED right at the back in, in, a, in a little pocket. That's what we always mm. do. And um, it just gives you an overall wash of light and even wash of light in the niche. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably a bit more forgiving if you tend not to have any everything kind of arranged in your niche in the shower. Yeah. You know, you might have shampoo bottles in one corner, your um, your scrub or your flannel kind of in the other side, so. So if you're messy, go for an LED strip, <laughs> is what Anthony's trying to say. I'm just being kind, I'm just being kind. Okay, what are your favorite bulbs for table lamps? Again, this is another principle from John Cullen, but tell her that you can get them in an extra warm. Um, I think it's something like 2,400 Kelvin, which is like a really warm light. You always use a table lamp at night, so and it's nice to have 
the extra ambience and the lighting. So yeah, I think taller bulbs are quite good. I'm a massive geek when it comes to light and design. I was just telling Sally's story, my favorite fitting of theirs is the Vorses. <laughs> so <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> you appreciate that. <laughs> Did you have like a fan moment there? A little bit, a little bit, yeah. But, is that um, the first time you've met Sally? It is, yeah, yeah, she is fab. She's okay, this is a good one. Do spotlights need to be symmetrical on the ceiling? No, they don't. I don't think they do. And a lot of people would probably disagree. Um, but I think they're always more about what they're lighting below rather than in the ceiling. Um, and my, my mother and father-in-law father helped them with their lighting. They, they, they moved and, and they were like, right, we want to make sure we get the lighting right. And um, they were like, what do you think? You know, grids in the ceiling. And I was like, no, no grids in the ceiling. <laughs> you light what you need and you'll put the light where you need it and then that makes sense even though it doesn't make sense on the ceiling because you might have one there and one there but it makes sense when you're in the space definitely and i think that is probably the most common mistake that we see or that the lighting designers see is people do this grid system and when you are lighting just in a grid the light just diffuses into the room, it makes everything really flat. You need to think about bouncing light off surfaces and that's gonna make your room feel much brighter, mm -hmm. much bigger, much more layered and interesting. So definitely don't fall down that trap. And I think the reason why people do it is because when you're designing, you're looking at floor plans and you're sort of doing what looks right from that elevation. But you never go into a room, lie on the floor, look at the ceiling and think, oh yeah, my spotlights look really nice and symmetrical. So just get that out of your head and what um, Sally said today is think about elevation. So think about your walls, how it's lighting there. So you need to have your artwork nicely lit. If you've got a beautiful texture, you need to light that. Have some up lighters by your fireplace. It's much more layered than mm -hmm. just thinking about the ceiling looking like a grid. My pet hate is lighting design when it's all like trying to draw the attention to the lighting rather than complementing the other things in the room. So LED strips that aren't probably um, diffused, if you can see the little bulbs and it like looks like little spotlights. If you can see the LED strip at all, like I think we spend so much time when we're doing joinery design trying to hide the LED strip. When I see it on show, it just kills me. What about you, Anthony? Mine is bad, I don't know if this makes me sound precious because I'm gonna do a designer, but bad, <laughs> bad lighting in restaurants, yes. I think, always gets me because it can be such a buzzkill. If yeah, that's the word. Totally, it ruins the meal. Yeah, and especially if it's three thousand k as yeah. well. You sat there with this. You feel like you're Spotlight, in a football stadium, yeah. um, and it's just it's not a nice, nice yeah. way to enjoy your food. Yeah, you've done your makeup. You're trying to look hot, and you've got a spotlight yeah. making you look really wrinkled. And for me and... as well, you know, <laughs> it's all about sculpture and the hair at the minute. And um, yeah, yeah. The, the more narrow the beams above me, the better. I can't tell you the amount of times Kevin has to stop me from getting up and being like, can you please dim the lights? He's like, just don't say it, they'll spit in your food, don't ask them to dim the lights. But genuinely, it, like, it ruins the meal for me, so I'm, I'm with you. She was dimming the lights at our wedding as well. <laughs> was I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember. That never happened. I don't remember. <laughs> well, you were secretly thanking me for it, weren't yeah, you? So yeah. I saved it, you a job. It did need to be dim. We were being polite. But um, <laughs> it was just a quick fall against the wall and the lights went down. And everyone looked ten times better. Yeah. It's all coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all Anthony on this. <laughs> Are all lights dimmable or do I need to be buying specific lights that can dim? No, you, that's something you do need to look out for because it's quite easy to get caught out. Um, quite a lot of spotlights or any lights aren't dimmable. Even bulbs, or quite a lot of those still, even nowadays, aren't dimmable. So it'll quite often say um, on the internet source or wherever it is you're buying from them if they're specifically not dimmable. Um, but if I remember rightly, even if you're searching, there's often a search function on websites where you can select dim dimmable lighting, um, even on Amazon. One of the things I think people most want to know, and I think you'll be really good to answer this question because I know you're so handy in your own home with all your DIY projects, is what can people do to improve their lighting at home if they haven't got the budget to go to John Cullen, they don't want to rip down ceilings, they're not doing joinery, what little tips have you got that they can maybe do, things they might be able to buy off Amazon, is there anything that you can think of that would really yeah. transform their lighting? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, being quite a bit of a geek about lighting, I like good lighting in my home. So we have lots of indirect lighting. We've got um, lovely period fireplaces in our in our home. And what we've done is purchased some um, little freestanding up lighters that we put at the base of each fire. 
and we've got some narrow beam spotlights from Corsten um, in those and they, they, they just provide a lovely ambient light in the evening but you, you can also put those up lights behind plants um, in the corners of room where you want to create some light if it's a bit of a dark spot um, so that's that's a good tip. You could even use those above. I use one in Kevin's um, study above, um, like a unit like that, to mm -hmm. wash the ceiling. It looks yeah, really effective. Exactly. And then um, we've actually got it's a bit of an old system now, so we do need to upgrade it. But we've got all all of our table lamps um, on a remote control dimmer, um, and that in itself has got it's these little modules that you plug into the wall, and you plug the table lamp into it, and you can set scenes on it. Um, so even though it's not an advanced lighting design system, we have the ability to you know, control the lighting within our home and just create a bit of ambience rather than it just being on and off at the table lamp. Um, I remember years ago we moved house and m one of my friends commented on how many table lamps we actually have because I think we had eight in one room. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it looked beautiful though. Yeah, it looked great. I hope you guys have found this helpful. We've loved doing this video for you. Um, I'll put all the information in the links below, including Sally Story's amazing book. And we'll see you very soon.